Okay, guys, I'm here today for the great John Dan here. Huge honor for me, as always. I just came to New York City and I couldn't not visit John and try to learn a little more. So today, John is going to show us here how to do the perfect here neck choke. So I think here neck choke is one of the most popular Jiu Jitsu techniques, but even though many people struggle to finish in the right way. So let's go, John. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's probably fair to say in our first day in Jiu Jitsu, Probably the first offensive move that we got taught was the way that uh, choke as it's often referred to. Let's uh, start off by saying something a little bit about the nature of what you're doing. Um, your intention when you get behind someone and go to uh, employ the, the rear naked is not so much to choke them as it is to strangle them. Okay, let's understand what the attack is upon. It's an attack upon uh, the blood to your brain. Um, Choking usually implies some kind of obstruction in the air passage, whether it be from the outside or something you ingested. So choking is typically done at the dinner table, um, or strangulation is something which occurs on the mats. Uh, understand that the general geography that you're working with, the human neck, uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating little puzzle you're going to have to solve. Most necks uh, among your training partners are somewhere between uh, 14 to 18 inches in circumference. And inside that small area, there's a lot of hardware. There's two carotid arteries, there's two subspinal arteries, there's jugular veins going in the opposite directions, and of course there's the trachea, the, the main air passage, and they're all packed very closely together. Understand this, whenever you go to attack one, indirectly, you're always going to attack some of the others. They're just so closely packed together in such a small space, People always obsess over, you know, am I attacking the blood here or am I attacking the air? It's almost impossible to attack one without the other, okay? So even if you did have uh, a stranglehold applied directly on the, on the, on the trachea, the, the Adam's apple as it's often referred to, indirectly the pressure inwards will compromise the, uh, the carotid arteries and your opponent will pass out in a relatively <coughs> short period of time. Always remember that strangulation has its effect much faster than uh, cutting off the air supply. If you cut off the blood supply, unconsciousness will generally result in somewhere between uh, five to 10 seconds, depending upon the circumstances. If you cut off the air supply, someone can stay cognizant and operating for minutes, okay, depending upon how much air they ingested before their last breath. So there's a big difference between strangulation and choking. One is dramatically faster and more efficient than the other. The good news is, because everything's packed together so tightly inside the neck, almost always the strangle will take effect long before the, uh, the choking or asphyxiation effect. Now, with that as a background, let's start talking about the most fundamental method that we all learn to attack the carotid arteries and start strangling people from the back. This is the, the rear naked strangle. Now, if you're anything like Bernardo and I, you've probably had some frustrating experiences in your time where you learned a lot of skills to put someone down, pass their guard, work your way through a hierarchy of pins, then you end up behind someone, you've done all that work, you've done an amazing job, and then you get behind them and you fail with the strangle. It's the most frustrating experience that you can have. You're like, oh my God, I did, I did 10 minutes of hard work and I got nothing to show for it. Um, so it's important that we have a, just a very tight, efficient strangulation. Okay, let's run through some of the key elements now. Um, there's a lot we could say about strangulation. It's a, it's a, it's a big, big topic, and it was covered in uh, the Into the System series and the Back Attack series. But there's also some essential knowledge that we can teach you in a fairly short period of time that will make a, a big difference to your performance of the move next time you get behind someone in a strangle situation, okay? So let's start off. We're gonna drill the move in an artificial fashion, okay? We're gonna have a seated opponent in front of us, and I'm gonna be kneeling behind Bernardo. Now, obviously, in a combat situation, I would be sitting behind him, and my two hooks would be in, and we'd work from there. But for demonstration purposes, it's a little clearer to show you the mechanics of the strangle when I'm taller than Bernardo by kneeling behind him, okay? Let's talk first about control. One of the most common mistakes we see here is people come in with two arms over the top and start trying to strangle from positions like this. Now, I don't have any ability to control Bernardo's rotation from here. And so he could easily turn towards me and I have no ability to strangle him now, okay? So the first thing you gotta be able to do is you gotta be able to stop your opponent from rotating inside your arms. And the way we do this is by putting one arm under 
and one arm over. Okay, so if Bernardo rotates it to our right, my left hand will make it very difficult. I put my elbow in front of his shoulder, Bernardo goes to rotate in the opposite direction, it's very difficult. Okay, and if I had two hooks in, it would be even more difficult. Okay, so your first thing, shut down his ability to rotate. When I have two arms over the top, I have very little ability to stop him from rotating. And as a result, he can turn into me, and now all the strangle angle is gone, okay? So always, we start with a control hand. My hand goes underneath and locks onto my training partner like so. Alternatively, I can lock my own hands, and that will create a similar effect, a seatbelt grip. And this too will put an elbow in front of his shoulder and a hand underneath his arm, so that when Ara goes to rotate inside me, you'll find it impossible. So whether you choose locked hands with a seat belt or open hands with a one-on-one -on -one grip, that's an individual choice. They're both good choices. They have their respective good and bad, okay? Now, at some point, we're gonna start going into a strangulation here, okay? And the first problem you're gonna run into is your opponent putting his chin down defensively, okay? When we start off talking about strangles from the back, let's understand something. We've got a clear goal in mind. That goal, is to create situations where Bernardo's chin is a certain distance away from his chest. If there's no distance and the chin is down, strangulation becomes <clears throat> quite difficult, okay? Ultimately, we'll see there's ways uh, around even this, but it's nice to be able to get underneath your opponent's chin to enact the most efficient strangles, okay? So how much space do I require between his chin and his chest for me to, to effectively strangle? Simple answer. Whatever the width of your wrist is, that's the space, okay? So if I ever see Bernardo's chin is away from his chest, away from the chest, and it's the width of my wrist, I will immediately go in and start my strangles, okay? Once the wrist penetrates, the rest of your forearm will easily follow, okay? It's the wrist which is the initial target, okay? If I get my wrist under, there's no way he'll be able to stop the rest of my arm following it, okay? Now, um, a question is, well, what if my opponent's chin is down? And as a result, my wrist can't fit. Well, then we have to start playing a game. And that game can be described in terms of a metaphor. And that metaphor is a knife, okay? Think about a knife that you use in the kitchen every day to cut things. That knife has an edge, which is extraordinarily sharp. And it has a spine on the top, which is actually pretty blunt. You could take the spine of that knife, turn the knife upside down, and you'll never cut yourself, okay? It's very broad and very blunt. If you turn the knife back down to the edge, it's like that, you'd cut your own hand off. So uh, there's a dramatic difference between the spine of the knife, which is very thick and can't cut anything, and the edge, which is very thin and can cut through anything. You have to start thinking about your hand and forearm in the same fashion as the knife. You want to create a thin edge that can easily cut through underneath the jawline and then progressively get thicker and thicker towards the wrist until ultimately all the way up to the elbow and forearm. Okay, so let's bring the camera in close and see how this might happen. Okay, we've established a control hand here. Okay, Bernardo's chin is down. I can't go in with the wrist straight away. It's too thick. It'll never fit underneath the chin. So what I do is I select the smallest, thinnest part of my hand. And that thinnest part is going to be the knuckle of my thumb. Okay? I make a flattened fist. Don't make a big, thick, clumsy fist. That's even thicker than your wrist. It'll never get through it. Make a flat fist. Reinforce the thumb in your index finger. And have your knuckle protruding out. So as Bernardo buries his chin down to the chest, we form the flattened fist. The first point of contact is my thumb knuckle. Behind the ear, it digs in underneath the chin. Turn down hard, but that'd be nice, good. And I go in with the thumb. Once the thumb penetrates, I go to the second thinnest part of my hand, which is my fingers. I extend my fingers and I finger walk across. Now, the whole thumb is gotten underneath my opponent's chin. We're starting to slide into our opponent's neck in the same way a knife starts to cut into whatever medium you're cutting through, be it meat or what have you. Now, as I walk further and further across, my wrist has penetrated. Okay, so I started with the thinnest part, the thumb, 
and I graduated to the fingers, and now I've gotten all the way to the wrist. Once we get the wrist in, we perform a trick. I use the flattened hand to lift, and then the whole elbow follows. And ultimately, the forearm and elbow penetrates around, and we find ourselves in the perfect strangulation position. Okay? So once again, we work in a sequence. The first part of the sequence is the thumb knuckle, and the point of contact is behind the ear, working our way underneath the jaw. So even when Bernardo does his best to put that chin down, go strong, but I, I can always get the thumb knuckle under. Then the fingers extend and we walk until the whole thumb is underneath. When he puts that chin down tight, too late. Now from here, I walk the wrist. When the wrist is successfully penetrated, we lift, and then the whole forearm and elbow follows. Now I take my hand, let's take a camera high, looking down. I take my whole hand behind the nape of his neck here. I never put my hand here on the shoulder where he can reach up and peel my hand. I want to hide my hand from his. There's no way he can make effective contact. Now it's time for me to take the control hand out and I want to cross my wrists. A common, common mistake here is people grab their bicep, I've now exposed my hand to my opponent. I'll never finish a strangle now. I want to minimize hand exposure by putting my hand over my own wrist. As a result, I can take my elbow forward over his shoulder and pass my hand across. Now, here's a common mistake. People put the hand on top of the skull. Now I've exposed my hand to my opponent. I always want to put my hand on my own shoulder. Let's bring the camera in front so that my hands are not exposed to my training partner. Now the last thing, I want to lock my hand in place. And I use my chin to do that, okay? And as a result, we're set in place. Now from here, to actually finish the strangle, I use a rotational method, where I take my right elbow over my training partner's right shoulder. <coughs> and as a result, we get a very powerful strangle. Let's have a look at that whole sequence one more time. Starting behind an opponent, we stop our opponent from rotating inside our arms by locking either seatbelt or one-on-one. -on -one. From here, I use the strangle hand, a flattened fist. We penetrate with the thumb knuckle first, then we graduate to the fingers, then the thumb, and ultimately the wrist. Once the wrist is penetrated, lift, and the whole forearm. I push the elbow around the corner and then hide my hand from my opponent. Once the hand is hidden and my head is forming an effective wedge to prevent movement, my control hand is released. Now, I never expose my hands to my opponent. The hidden hand goes in behind and remains hidden here. If you put the camera directly in front of Bernardo's face, you should be able to see my fingernails. Let's move to the right. You should be able to see my fingernails. If you cannot see my fingernails, it's a less effective strangle. So make sure you punch all the way across and lock. Now, we've got a good set strangle. Lock it into place with your head position. And then finally from here, even if Bernardo puts all of his hands in defensively, uh, get a good grip on my wrist, good grip on my forearm, good. If I enact in this way, if I just try to compress my elbows and go forward, but not pull down tight, strong, 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 I can't strangle. But the moment I use the rotational method, <coughs> it will bite right through my, my apologies, no, 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 no. Bite <laughs> right through my opponent's defensive hands and get through to an effective strangle. Remember guys, we're not just talking about a situation where you're strangling a beginner. You have to go to strangle people that spend considerable amounts of time defending strangleholds. If my opponent was naive, there's no work to be done. You just throw everything through and finish. It's easy, okay? But to strangle someone who's got good set defensive arms, that's a trick. It's not an easy one. And the idea of using the power of rotation to go through your opponent's defensive hands is very important. Now let's quickly start to summarize some of the main themes that we've worked here, okay? First, Ultimately, we want to be able to penetrate underneath our opponent's jaw. You know what he's going to do. He's going to want to put that jaw down as tight as he can, shoulders up, chin down. Okay? So we've got to have an effective game plan to get through underneath that jaw. 
ultimately our goal is to get our wrist underneath but it's too thick to go underneath on someone who's set their jaw defensively so we have to work with the thinnest parts of the human hand and go thin thick thicker thicker until we get to thickest the whole elbow and forearm just as a knife has a very thin edge which separates matter until ultimately the thick spine can follow and you can cut an object in half but you could never do it in the reverse order by pushing with the spine first you wouldn't cut anything okay so too your strangle hand works in the same principle we use the very thin but quite robust thumb knuckle to first penetrate underneath the jawline then we extend fingers then we get the whole thumb then the wrist we lift and then shoot the whole arm until ultimately we get the very thickest part of the arm the elbow forearm and bicep into a strangulation position the next big challenge you're going to face is hiding your hands from your opponent nothing more frustrating than getting all that set getting underneath your opponent's jaw and he just grabs your hands and peels them off you can't expose your hands to your opponent so everything we do we work with cross wrists into a hidden hand and the hand is behind the head not exposed on top of the skull and as a result, we can employ a rotational method where I rotate my elbow in a circle so I can employ the strength of my back to strangle rather than just squeezing with my arms and exhausting myself in a very futile and ineffective method of strangulation. Okay? If we can do these things, you can have a deadly, deadly strangle in a short period of time. Now, those are just the mechanics of the strangle. Um, obviously, there's a mountain of things that you need to know about how to set your hooks, how to maintain the position overall. All of these things were covered in, into the system in excruciating detail. But those are the key elements once you've gotten behind your opponent to actually form an effective seal around your opponent's uh, carotid arteries and uh, create a strong strangle, even against a knowledgeable, resisting opponent. Yeah, but John, what was amazing here for me was to see like how many details you are able to put in the most basic submission you have in your jiu right? The two most basic submissions you might have, it might be the here neck choke or the arm bar. Yeah, I think those are probably the two most used submissions. Yeah, possible. but look how many details, like how to open the neck. Right in the beginning you showed one that uh, I had never seen, like how when you were just blocking the person to go to one side to the other, you used this elbow yeah. against the shoulder. Think about it, feel behind me, Bernardo? Yeah. The big danger here is I'm going to start rotating and turning yep. inside. If, if you had hooks in, for example, I'd turn inside your yep. hooks and escape. Most escapes this position are ultimately turning escapes, right? Turn inside yep. your arms. But when you clamp down on this elbow, yep. I can't move to my left. Yep. And now when you clamp down on your other elbow, I can't move to my right. Got it. And now I'm pinned in place, okay? And now, to get out of here, because you're doing such a good job of pinning with those two elbows, you're controlling me between two elbows, I have to take bigger and bigger risks of movement to get out. I agree. What does that do? It lifts my yes. neck. Start exposure. Okay. So, okay. so much of the game starts with elbow control. Okay, as you lock in here, I feel like I can't yeah. move now. As opposed to if you're limp with that elbow, yeah, it's so much easier now to start working out yeah. and get defensive. But you ultimately, uh, upper body control is control between two elbows. If you sit down behind me, now, Bernardo, and put two hooks in, your lower body control is between two knees. Yep. And your upper body control is between two elbows. And yep. when you play both of those effectively, I can't turn for anything. Yep. And now you're going to have an easy time fixing up my wrist. Good. Now let's penetrate through. First with the thumb, then the fingers extend. Walking, walking, walking. Good. Now lifting, shooting the arm in one motion. Beautiful. And now taking this one out. Good. Locking. No exposure of the hands. A rotation to the right as we fall down in this direction, and it's done. Beautiful. Okay. You see how it all starts with elbow control, and yes. when the hooks are in, control between two knees. Once you start off that sense of control, that's when you start bringing in the, the notion of the strangle itself. So there's some crucial uh, details for taking the most foundational of all the submission attacks in the sport of Jiu-Jitsu, and the one you'll be using all the way through your career, the one which probably my students are yep. most famous for. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm absolutely certain that next time you get behind someone and you're in a position to finish with a, uh, a red naked strangle, you'll be able to do a better job 
based on those principles. Yeah, Gordon in the ADCC this year, for example, yeah, yeah. the he's, he's strength very from the back was yeah. probably like the main submission yeah. and by, by he was right. Yeah. 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 The funny thing is that that was a deliberate policy on his part. He, um, before ADCC, he said to me, you know, I'm sick of these people saying I'm, I'm a one-trick pony with leg locks. I'm using nothing but strangles. <laughs> and uh, so he just went out and strangled almost all of his opponents. Yeah. He, he just chooses what submission he was going to use. Yeah. Um, but yeah, absolutely one of the foundational moves of the sport and one which all of us have a duty to maximize our effectiveness with. Uh, always remember, the, the red-legged strangle is just this incredible, magical move. It gives you almost like a, a superhero's ability to turn a human being off like a goddamn light switch. Now that's a very, very valuable skill to have, not just in a sport, but also a self-defense situation. I, I kid you not when I say, if you're ever in a situation where the shit hits the fan and you're fighting for your life, I guarantee you the rear naked strangle will be your best friend in a one-on-one -on -one unarmed fight. Um, it's a move that we all have a duty to master. Yeah, and the, the name of this, uh, strangle in Portuguese is Mata Leão, like kill the lion. Yeah, so it lion shows lion. like, <laughs> yeah. It's so a, it's a good example. It's, a, it's an excellent name for it, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. But um, that was fascinating. I, I, I yeah. always love going over foundational moves like that. They're always, no, they're always fun things to teach. Yeah. Oh, Joe, and the, all your entire system about back attacks is in the enter the system That's back good. attacks yeah. instruction, right? Yeah. Yeah, so guys, make sure to check that out. Like, enter the system back attacks by John Danaher, bjjfanatics.com. He goes over the here naked strangle and much, much more. I, I was there when he shot, and it was amazing. Like, it was strangles from everywhere from the back, and all the details about trap with the leg, trap with the arm, if the opponent moves to one side, moves to the other side from turtle. So, that was really, really cool. The game gets very deep very quickly. Yep, thanks so much, John. Appreciate it. Awesome. Please help me out to grow my YouTube channel. Just click subscribe. And to watch more videos, just click under see more videos. I hope you enjoyed. BJJFanatics.com. Use the promo code YouTubeFaria to get 10% off any instructional video. Improve your jujitsu faster.